Hi everyone, um, and welcome to Access the Text for November, the second last one of the year. Uh, we have a very jam-packed Access the Text today. Uh, joining us today, back to the. We have myself, of course, who will be here um, doing this bit, and then we'll have uh, Saj, the Applications Development Director, talking about some items from the Development Council. Uh, we'll have Anne Lawoko talking about SASBOS 2.0, our head of product, and David Winbanks, our lead product manager for UC Express, giving a whole heap of UC Express updates. So, as I said, we'll be discussing SASBOS 2.0 first with Anne. We'll be talking about the Development Council with Saj and UC Express updates with Mr. Winbanks. I'll hand over to Anne now so she can start off. Awesome, thank you. Um, I am, am I on mute? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. No, I'm really excited to talk about Sasbos 2.0. It's been a very long time coming. I think when I joined Access 4 a bit over two years ago, it was on the roadmap and we've been working towards uh, what that can look like and we're very, very close to rolling it out in December. So it's finally coming true uh, and I'm gonna walk you through the, the first phase of the changes today. So what Sasbos 2.0 is, um, it's really about your user experience. So it's making things more intuitive, making things easier to do, it's making things quicker and, and reducing overheads. So in the first phase of this, we couldn't do all SASBOS in, in one go. We're rolling it out, getting feedback, making improvements. What we're focusing on the first one is navigation and ease of accessing things. So what we're um, targeting is the menus and the customer, uh, customer enterprise area. So you'll notice is, first of all, there is a new look. It looks different to SAS, what SASBOS does now. There's new colors, new fonts, um, but otherwise everything's kind of in, in the same place. So if I walk you through the menu, so on the left there, you can see it's white now. So it's much lighter, uh, re easy to read. Um, and we've basically brought things together to make it easier to find what you're looking for. The biggest notable difference is that we've changed from the terminology um, enterprises to customers. So that's to be a bit more intuitive in terms of language we're using. And so we're not so much just on the um, Broadworks side. Um, we're, we're a bit agnostic there. But otherwise, everything's in the same spot. What you'll notice, and an idea, so this everything that we've done has been designed with partners, either by an idea that came from a partner or with partners in focus groups giving feedback and telling us how, uh, how to use it, how they want to use it, I should say. So one of the things that came up was the menu, having the hover opening and closing doesn't always work for everyone. They would love to be able to pin it open or closed. So you can see a little chevron next to the SAS boss icon. That allows you to pin the menu to the left and get a bit more um, uh, landscape to work in, we can keep it open. Uh, so that's one of the, the improvements for intuitiveness. Um, it's now also, as I said, the customers, groups and services mm -hmm. services have now moved under customers just to make it a bit easier to find. And we've also um, made, made some changes there, but otherwise everything's uh, basically in the same place. Um, when it's, that's, that's the, uh, the menu pinned. So it goes just to little icons. You can still get to the sub menus when you click on them. Um, and again, it's just about making navigation easier. Now here's where some of the more major changes have taken place. So this is what SASBOS 2.0 design styling for my UX team. This is the dream, what it looks like. Um, all the pages will eventually have this treatment and have the 2.0 2, um, uh, UX and UI changes. But we focused on was customers first because it is the most used area in SASBOS. We were getting all the data of what has the most traffic and where people are going through and customers, it was extremely, extremely high. So we've done this one first, we can get the feedback and then we're gonna roll it out to the rest of SASBOS in phases. But what you'll see here is customers, it's the same page. For 2.0, you do not require any new training. It is just a look change, but we've added some nice new features. So you're familiar, the, the page always had a list of your customers there. There's the create new across the top. Uh, what we have added is the groups and services uh, columns within the table. So at a glance, you can see all your customers, but then also how many groups and services they are. You can sort by, sort by that column. And then the actions button is now a three dot ellipses on the right there. So all, all your controls are still there. It's just um, a bit easier to read and a bit easier to use. 
Now, when you go into the customer itself, we haven't changed the main page. So that's, that's all there as you're used to seeing it. But what we've added here is you can now see all the groups, services, dids, and devices for that customer across in the tabs. So if you look at the image, you can see this is Acme um, PTY LTD. The manage customer page is the same information you know, are used to seeing about a customer, but you can then go across to the groups and services and dids and, and devices and see all of them for that customer in one shot. So this is really about making all the information easier to find. You don't have to go out to the, the groups page and then filter by that customer again to see the groups for it. It's all in the one place. So again, navigation easier, intuitiveness, um, and it's not big changes and it's just additions. So we're not taking anything away, we're just making it easy to find. Um, so again, as I mentioned, this is coming out in December. This is being launched um, early, early December. So it's kind of a Christmas present. And it was a Christmas present for me to be able to launch it. I'm very excited about it. Um, but there will be, as I mentioned, other phases rolling out. So we'll be bringing, working on our phase two to bring it to more, more pages and then get it across to all of SASPOS as we go. So there is another webinar on this later today. We're gonna to go into a bit of a deeper dive and actually open up SASPOS live and. Uh, go through it. So if you would like to subscribe uh, to sign up to come to that one, uh, there is there is the code on the on the screen. Um, but we'll be covering very similar information. So you guys are all you know the biggest users of SAS Boss. I think this will be quite intuitive to you. Again, we don't require any training. Nothing's being majorly changed. So if you're happy with just understanding that, you probably don't need to go to that one. But we will go into a bit more detail if you'd like to turn that one as well. And there'll be a live Q&A and Matt, our head of channel, will also be in that webinar. So he'll be able to um, answer some, any other questions too. Cool. All right, uh, let's hand over to Saj and let him talk about the Development Council. Saj, over to you, mate. Cool, thanks, John. <clears throat> Are you bringing up the presentation? Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Saj. Uh, I'm the head of development and one of the co-founders of Access4. So I'm really excited to talk about the Dev Council program. Um, so what is the Dev Council program? On this presentation, you can see our vision and mission statement of what we want to achieve from this uh, program. So if I summarize it, our vision is um, for the council to help you develop innovative ideas to enhance your customer experience. And our vision is to encourage innovation collaboration to provide support uh, to create mutual success by providing unique solutions to your customers. So Pete always mentions this in his conferences and uh, talks to the partners. So your success is our success. And this is one of those initiatives that we help you keep delighting your customers to allow you to win more opportunities. Uh, this program has uh, limited capacity. So uh, I'll be covering um, some of the partner requirements uh, later in this uh, presentation. So, and it will get you access to, um, uh, on a monthly basis uh, with the subject matter experts uh, within Access4. During these sessions, we will collaborate and help you tackle any challenges that you may go through uh, when providing these integrations. Uh, and we'll be covering some of those best practices again later in this presentation to help you understand what to expect uh, from this program. So some of the benefits uh, of using this program is to identify white space in the market and target verticals uh, with a solution that help you differentiate from the rest of the competition. Um, as you know, uh, like within our market, uh, like customer churn is uh, quite prevalent. So again, providing these uh, bespoke solutions and integrations will help your customers be stickier uh, with your solution. You are the subject matter expert, so uh, understanding your customers' uh, needs. So this program will help you target and create those integrations with our help. And think about like how we can automate like tasks as well to reduce uh, your staff overhead and providing uh, them uh, time to focus on other priorities. We can go to the next slide, thank you. So we are covering uh, some of the common like use cases that will help you think about like what, what this council uh, and this program will help you target. So the first one is a law firm. So if you think about law firms, they build their customers uh, based on time. So 
the time they spend with their customers uh, is important that they need to be able to track. So again, uh, one of the common ways of uh, these lawyers will keep in touch with their customers is over the phone. So using the Salesforce API to uh, pull like CDI information in regards to the customer and providing it via itemized invoice will help uh, in, improve that customer experience and provide more accurate uh, billing and reduce uh, revenue leakage. Um, one of the other uh, uh, common scenarios when you think about a law firm is the conversations that they're having with their clients. These calls will be recorded and uh, need to be provided easily to the customer and to the actual person who's dealing with a, a legal matter. So using the Salesforce API, again, you'll be able to pull these call recordings into a CRM and store securely so that you can access those or provide access to their customers uh, seamlessly. Next use case is uh, a hotel. So typically in hotel rooms, there is uh, phones or handsets available in each of the rooms. And using again, the Salesforce API as a, a person is checking in, you can enable and disable those phones uh, for uh, to enable calling. So again, uh, when the person checks out, uh, you would pro want to provide the calls that they have made uh, using the handset. So utilizing again the Salesforce API, you're able to pull those CDRs uh, in real time and generate that uh, itemized invoice so that again, you're capturing that revenue and making sure that uh, there's accurate billing provided to the, uh, to the end customer. Um, next, we're focusing on a car service center. So if you think about a car service uh, center operator uh, who's answering a call, imagine providing the service history of a customer who's calling. So utilizing our CTI API, again, I will be covering like the types of APIs available later in this session. You can actually provide that car service history as they answer the call. So again, helping that, uh, improving that customer experience uh, when they're calling that car service center. Uh, next use case is about providing reminders to customers uh, within that car service center. So providing like reminders to come in and uh, service their car in a regular timely manner will improve that uh, repeat business into uh, that car service center. Lastly is about automating internal processes. So this will, uh, using the Salesforce API, you will be able to tightly integrate some of the products that you may not procure through uh, Access4. Uh, again, with the with the access for products as well. So uh, think about like data products. So uh, access for does not uh, provide data products, but you may procure that through another carrier. So again, helping you bundle uh, both of those uh, products together and providing a seamless invoice to your uh, customers. Also, uh, think about how you can improve your internal business processes. So. If you want to provision a customer that is using the Access4 products as well as the data products, you can seamlessly integrate that within your own CRM system or, or your own BSS OSS platform to actually provide that uh, uh, bundled solution together and provision it seamlessly using our APIs. Um, next slide, please, John. So um, like I mentioned, there is uh, limited capacity uh, within um, uh, this program. And again, we want you to be successful. And how you can be successful is by meeting some of these requirements uh, that are, are part of this program. So um, you need to have an internal development resource, so a resource who has development experience, some level of understanding of test-driven uh, development, how to understand capturing logs and a request and response data so we can troubleshoot any issues that may arise uh, doing this integration. Again, having access to the, to the Dev Council, you will have uh, subject matter experts from Access4 itself will help you kind of uh, go through this process with your, with your dedicated resource. And lastly, with the resource, we want to make sure that they have adequate capacity to focus on these projects. Again, to be successful, they need to have that capacity to focus on it so you can actually deliver the integrations in a timely manner. Next is about the hosting infrastructure requirements. So 
Um, these integrations and apps that you may develop needs to be hosted uh, somewhere. So again, the expectation is uh, most of our partners will have some sort of Azure or some sort of uh, Google or AWS infrastructure already in, in the cloud. So again, uh, making sure that you have adequate uh, infrastructure available to host these applications. And next is about to access the API, you will require a static IP or IPs. Uh, again, making sure that you have those available so that we can open our, our security firewalls and so forth to gain you access into the, the SASPOS API. Lastly, it's about compliance requirements. So ensure that you have proper liability insurances available and making sure that you comply with all laws to ensure that proper protection is in place to allow um, to avoid any illegal or malicious activity. So again, making sure that you have those and most businesses will have that available, but making sure that you keep that front and center uh, when you're thinking about uh, uh, joining this program. Next slide, please, John. So we have uh, two, um, two sets of APIs available uh, within uh, the Access for Environment. So uh, first is the SASPOS APIs. Um, so SASPOS API is designed API, uh, in API first uh, design uh, methodology. So what that means is that even for us, when we are providing access via SASPOS UI, we will design the API first. So keeping uh, the developer experience in mind and making sure that uh, it's nice and easily uh, to be integrated and also taking the complexity out of the, the backend systems that we integrate with. So it's we want to keep it nice and simple, similar to our own developers who would have the same uh, APIs available uh, for them to provide the actions and tasks that are provided through the, the SASPOS UI. So our APIs are like a not afterthought, so again, we want to make sure that that experience is uh, ex exceptional. The APIs are built uh, in a RESTful, uh, it's a REST API. So again, it's it's quite a common, uh, I guess, way of uh, API methodology that we're using. So it's so any developers who has REST API um, experience will be able to easily integrate with the uh, SASPOS API. Um, also, uh, we are improving our API documentation uh, continuously. So when you're thinking about any of the integrations, if you take the example of uh, what you're uh, having access via the SASPOS UI, all of those tasks and actions are APIable. So if there's no documentation currently available within the API uh, document that is available through PRC, please reach out to us. We will be able to provide you the necessary um, uh, actions that are required through the API. So uh, again, uh, don't be discouraged if it's not in the documentation, we'll be able to provide that via the, via the program so that you have access to all the necessary required information to integrate uh, with any uh, bespoke solutions you want to provide. Next is the uh, computer telephony integration API. So uh, if you think about the use case I was uh, providing earlier about the car service center, where the operator had the car service history for the caller uh, who's calling that car service center, CTI API will allow you to do that. It will help you identify the caller, the, call, uh, the number that they're calling from, and help you understand uh, what CRM record to, uh, to pull out to provide that car service uh, history. Again, think about like how you can uh, manage call origination, terminations, uh, presence updates for call center agents and so forth. Also about on-hook, off-hook status of your handsets. All that can be incorporated using the, the CTI API. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here I'm gonna be talking about some of the best practice uh, and to kind of demonstrate some of the uh, information we'll be providing when we go through the uh, the program itself. So first is about security and authentication. So authentication to the SASPOS API can be done via a username password that can be created already through the, the SASPOS uh, login management interface that is already available for you to uh, manage your own staff logins, for example. Um, 
creating the login. Uh, so if you're thinking about the type of integration that you're doing, uh, think about what type of status or what type of uh, access they require. So if they only require read-only uh, information, such as you're pulling in CDI information, set that login to be read-only. Um, if they're only uh, working on, uh, I guess, uh, provisioning uh, type actions, maybe set the uh, role level to an appropriate role level. So such as it, it just needs to be a resale admin, for example, you don't need super admin. So take into account what type of integrations you're doing and set the appropriate status. Again, through the program, we'll be able to guide you and uh, advise you what the best uh, set of um, permissions that you be uh, you should be setting. Um, also, the tokens that are generated by the API um, has an expiry, but they can be managed uh, if you continues to use it, like uh, you will be able to um, keep using that. The, ex uh, the expiry will be extending. Um, when storing authentication, keep in mind that it should be set in a secure manner. It should not be publicly available. So think about how you're going to store those credentials in the backend systems. Um, always use SSL and HTTPS uh, when uh, interacting with the API. So you should uh, have some sort of SSL certification uh, implemented in your application. So again, all of this will be able to guide you and help you in designing that application in a very secure manner. Next is about error codes and responses. So our API is quite simple for you to understand what's a success versus what's a, a, a failure or an error. So any codes uh, that are generated starting with two will be a success. Any codes generating with uh, starting with four or five will be an error. So again, it's quite simple for you to understand when a transaction has been successful versus a transaction has failed. It's always best to capture these uh, request and response data so that we can look at the logs and understand what has gone wrong. So when we provide you support, we have that uh, information that is necessary for us to understand what has gone wrong and provide you guidance in, um, in correcting it. Keep in mind there is rate limits and restrictions imposed with the API. So like I mentioned earlier in the infrastructure requirements, you do need to have a static IP when accessing the API. Um, also think about how you can um, uh, cache some data in regards to uh, not hitting those rate limits and so forth. We want to protect the partner experience from a platform perspective. So again, improving and having some sort of caching mechanism will help you uh, meet those, um, uh, uh, I guess, or stay within those limits uh, that are imposed from our end. Uh, these limits are documented in the, the SASPOS API documentation. So if you do have any questions, please let me know. Again, through the, the program, we'll be able to guide you and help you design that uh, application or integration in a, um, in a uh, performance uh, and make sure that the performance is met. Lastly, it's about data management. So please understand like what type of data you're interacting with. So again, uh, if I look at a use case that I mentioned earlier, the uh, call recording data, you wanna make sure that that data is stored in a secure manner because that, that is very sensitive data. So you wanna make sure that they're either encrypted or they're in a secure system that it's not publicly available. So take that into uh, consideration when you're designing the application. So again, more information will be provided when you join the program and we'll be having those one-on-one -on -one conversations in helping you design your application. So thank you. Uh, if you have any more questions, please reach out to your PGM or myself and we'll be able to guide you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Edge. Um, so just one thing I didn't note, uh, when we ask the questions, we'll answer those at the end. Um, so any questions you've got for Anne or Sage so far, and then David, once he's finished his presentation, we will answer at the end. So handing over to David now about UC Express updates. Thanks, John. Um, very excited to be here and talked about, uh, about some UC Express updates since launch. So uh, we did, um, launch in July this year and since then we've been busy uh, providing some additional features. Uh, we've been prioritizing those based on 
feedback from partners and so it's good to keep that feedback coming through so if you have um, particular features that you're looking for that aren't there um, uh, let us know and we'll we'll prioritize those as well so um, just going through the the big list so I'll go through the list quickly and then we'll go into a bit of a deep dive around some of these uh, features that we've uh, that we've provided so the first one is the option for ring group and queue name so this is really important for customers who are looking to display to agents which uh, queue or ring group the call is coming through from so you get the cli of the caller but you also get um, appended to that the ring group or queue name so that's now uh, available and uh, working in uc express there is a limitation around the mobile uh, directories so if that um, caller id is a name within the uh, directory on the mobile app then the ring group and queue names um, are replaced by whatever the name you've put into the mobile directory so we're working with the vendor to try and um, overcome that limitation but at the moment that's the limitation it only affects the mobile app um, on the desktop app um, you still see the ring group and queue names and uh, that also works with the um, with the handsets as well um, moving on to night switch so this is a common feature for customers who don't like to program um, into their phone system when um, when the main number switches over to night mode or, or business hours after hours so they'd prefer to do that via a manual switch on the phone um, so we've provided the ability to now have a configurable night switch um, attached to ring groups or queues and you can program a BLF um, button on a phone to uh, enable that night switch um, to forward to the night switch destination, which is different to the um, timeout destination or busy destination uh, for queues, etc. So we'll go through that a little bit later. Uh, the other one was the queue timeout destination. So originally when we launched, we had the ability to have the queue fail over to a voicemail um, uh, and this provides the uh, an additional destination. So, uh, if the timeout uh, timeout is reached, you can forward that call uh, to another destination um, or stay in the queue. Um, for the professional um, professional license, there's also a callback feature for the queue. But um, so this is uh, available. Uh, queue timeout destination is available on all the different license packs. So. Uh, we've also provided some call feature, um, sorry, call forward uh, always feature access codes. So this is the ability to use feature access codes to um, program into the buttons on the phone um, or, or use a star code um, to, to basically enable call forward busy um, or deactivate it. Um, also, you can set the call forward busy destination as well. So we'll go through that a little bit later. You use the Express Mobile app. We've done an update to that as well. So uh, this uh, originally you had the ability as an agent of a call center through the mobile app to um, basically put yourself uh, offline and that would log you out of all the queues at once. Um, and you could go back online and, and log in. You'd basically be logged into all the queues at once again. So this um, update provides the ability to log in and out of specific call queues. So if you're an agent of multiple queues, you could log out of one queue and still be um, uh, av available and active in other queues. So it's a more granular approach to call centers. Um, we've also made a little, a few little changes, the tidy ups to uh, UC Express voicemail. Um, originally, we were sending the, uh, if you enabled uh, voicemail to email we were sending a uh, an email with the um, with a link to the voicemail uh, and what we're doing now is actually uh, providing that as a web file as an attachment to the email instead and we're deleting that um, that voicemail off the server so that those voicemail boxes don't fill up so quick and we're also sending an email notification to the users when the email box is full um, the other thing that uh, was very popular at the start and um, uh, we've made available now is uh, we've, we've provided demo and training um, enterprises for all of the existing resellers that have agreed to the new terms. 
Um, also, any new reseller that comes on board where uh, we basically have automated the construction of the training and demo exp um, enterprises for UC Express as well as Broadworks. Um, so there are just one category of um, resellers who are left to do manually. So that is any reseller who hadn't yet agreed to the terms, um, but they're an existing reseller. Uh, if you approach your PGM, if you don't have access to a training and demo enterprise for UC Express, uh, we can manually create that for you. Paging groups, uh, again, we released paging groups quite early in um, after launch, but uh, paging groups, I'll go through uh, and show you how that works. But um, you can basically set up a paging group to uh, page uh, certain users within UC Express. Um, then we have some device management changes. So device manager was accessed via um, going into a, at a service level and going into the uh, handset that was attached to that service web. Now, um, bring that up to the group level so you can uh, log into the device manager just uh, from the group menu so it's easier access there and uh, again you can see all of the devices for the group and manage all of the devices then uh, through the device manager we've also uh, made available a switch between UDP and T TCP settings within that device manager menu as well um, the important thing here to remember is that um, for UC Express only, Broadworks is different, but for UC Express only, uh, TCP is on port 5080 and um, UDP is on port 5060. So if you do make that switch, you have to note the differences uh, and the impact that it might make in the network routing there. Um, and then the last one, uh, which is just recent, we've uh, made available the ability to view call recordings in SASBOS. Um, previously, it was only the supervisor who had access to view call recordings um, of agents. Uh, it's now available in SASBOS um, with the same permissions that exist today for Broadworks um, to view call recordings. So uh, what I'll do now is just take you through some of those uh, in a little bit more detail. So this is the queue improvements here. So the first box up the top here, you can see that there is the um, call queue um, timeout setting. And then next to that, now you have an option to um, uh, where previously it was just remaining queue. Uh, remaining queue, basically, if you've got voicemail activated, it will prompt the user to um, leave a voicemail once the timeout uh, timer is reached. Um, or if you're a professional and have the queue um, callback feature enabled, it will also prompt for to, to call back or stay in queue. Um, otherwise, you can now forward to a destination and the destination number is there available as well. So when you hit that timer, um, timeout, uh, you, you'll have that um, forward to timeout destination there. And the second box down the bottom there is um, the ability to... Uh, is the ability to um, provide a night switch. So this is very similar in both the queue um, menu and also the hunt group menu. But uh, again, it's it, once you turn that on, um, you have the ability to forward to a night switch. That's only half the uh, half the battle there. You still have to program the night switch button onto a phone, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, in between those two orange boxes, there's an arrow pointing to the display of the queue name when calling agents. So you can see that it's on no currently, but you can toggle that between yes and no. Um, importantly, if you have a call flow that fails over between queues and ring groups, and the final ring group or queue didn't have that um, toggle as yes, you wouldn't see the... Uh, it wouldn't display the queue name or ring group to the agent. So you do have to do it on each of the queues and ring groups in the call flow. Uh, most often that's single, but um, if you've got multiple, then you'd have to do it for each if you wanted to ensure that display name happens. So a little bit more uh, extra detail on setting up a night switch. So the first thing is to enable the night switch service on the ring group or call queue via SASBOT, which I've just shown you. And the second one is to go into the device manager and program a BLF line key type um, on the phone. Uh, and the um, 
the uh, the field where you specify the uh, the extension, you must put the letters NS followed by the extension of the uh, specific queue or ring group for that night switch. So once you do that, that becomes a, a BLF button on the phone. And when you um, toggle it, it will activate night switch or not. And the BLF light will change depending on if you've um, activated it or not. So that is uh, setting up night switch, which has been a popular request and um, some some uh, small businesses still use that sort of manual, manual process for um, toggling uh, night switch. Okay, um, this one is feature access codes. So originally we didn't have these available for call forward always. We now have made this possible. So uh, star 72 activates the call forward always with the existing destination. You may have previously set up the destination in SASBOS or via the, um, via the star code. Um, and then so pressing star 72 just activates that call forward to the existing destination. If you do star 72 followed by a number, then that will uh, change the forward destination to the number after the star 72. And it will also activate the call forward to that destination. And star 73 deactivates the, the call forward. So nice and simple there. Um, we are waiting for this to be updated in the feature access code list for UC Express. Um, but here you're seeing it first. Um, uh, in this Prezo, so uh, it will be updated on the list shortly in uh, PRC. Um, this is the mobile app, so this is where we're talking about the uh, more granular control of logging in and out of queues. So now you'll see if you're a call center agent, um, you could always see the queues you were logged into, and uh, up the top you could um, basically go online or offline, uh, which toggled you inside uh, all queues or out of all queues at once. Um, now you have that little icon um, on the right hand side there um, so you can just toggle each one of those for each queue you're a part of and you will either go online or offline um, by toggling that little switch there. Um, so as I said more granular control. When you do um, go offline so if you click the top offline button it basically logs you out of all queues at once you can also um, select one of the codes so you might be on lunch or a break or a meeting um, and you can set up those codes as well uh, or the supervisor can set up those codes or disposition codes for going offline so that's a little bit about the mobile app. Um, as I mentioned before, the device management is now easy to navigate to. So we've made that available in the group menu. And we've brought back the device management um, tab there that you can see. And in there, you'll have access to the uh, device manager. Um, you'll be able to switch between TCP and UDP settings. And as I mentioned before, different ports for the different settings. So um, be aware of that when you make that uh, make that switch. Uh, and the last one is paging groups. So again, at a, a group level, you can go in and create a paging group. You can select the agents that you want to be as targets for that page. And um, the thing to remember here with paging groups is that there must be a simultaneous call available per target in the paging group. So if you have 10 target users in that page, you would need to have attempt simultaneous call licenses available and those uh, simultaneous calls would also need to be vacant in order to reach all of those 10, 10 participants. So it is a little bit tricky to um, manage that but um, that is how the licensing works at the moment so something to remember there around paging groups. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed a quick update on all the things we've been doing around UC Express. We're still um, quite developing quite a few number of additional features. So uh, keep watching for more updates. And if you have any questions around those, please put them in the in the chat or ask your PGM or product team, and we'll get back to you with those uh, with those answers. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, just wanted to uh, thanks Dave for the great update on UC Express there. Uh, but I also wanted to go through some embargo dates uh, for this year. So the embargo, we've been got the details for the 2023 porting embargoes. So the embargo will start on the 22nd of December, which is quite late, a lot more later than I expected it to be, uh, until January 8th, which is a lot earlier than I expected it to be. What that means for you, the final day of 
uh, for all cutovers is December the 21st and cutovers will resume on January 9th of 2024. Uh, our porting team will proceed with accepting porting requests and scheduling bookings up until midday on Thursday, December 21st. And of course, we'll resume on January the 8th, 2024. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, please let myself know or ask your PGMs and they'll be able to answer uh, those questions or get a, a good answer for you. Uh, so any questions? So we have one question for Anne at the moment. Uh, dark mode for SAS Boss 2.0, Anne. Yes, dark mode. So uh, that's an idea that's been in the ideas portal for a little while now. What we've been focusing on is just getting the initial 2.0 styling rollout in its default form. Um, so we're going to continue working on that to update some of the other areas. Um, but dark mode is on the roadmap. Um, it will be coming after we've going through the SAS boss and the rest of the areas. So uh, in the ideas portal, to get it up in a higher priority, get, um, vote on it, get other people in your organization to vote on it. The more votes it gets, the higher it jumps up uh, in our system. And we review the roadmap from the ideas portal and we do that every week. So um, that's the best way to do it. It is coming. It's on the roadmap. We've um, been talking about access to text at, road, at the road shows. When we had those sessions, actually not a lot of people actually lifted their hand and said we would really need that. Um, but if there's a lot of you out there who would like to have that, get your votes in, that's how it will get to the top of the pile to get worked on next. So we don't currently have any more questions, but I'll give you another 30 seconds to ask any questions of Dave, Anne or Saj while we have them um, before we finish the session. Um, but a really great session and a lot of information from the, the three members of the team. Uh, and thank you very much for all attending. Really appreciate it. Anything? Any API? Any API? Sage, a question for you. Any API items for skip trunks? Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned earlier in the um, Prezo, it's um, any task or actions that you um, do action while the SAS boss UI is APIable. So, um, SIP trunks, again, no difference. Um, we can definitely provide that um, through the API. Call forward, yes. Um, again, it, it's APIable, and we'll be able to provide that. I believe it might be already in the API documentation, but I'll take this um, into my team, and we'll generate those documentation um, for Brian. Any other questions, Mitch? All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we will end the session there. Um, hope you all have a wonderful end of November and uh, we'll see you again in December for our favorite end of year session. Thank you. Uh, I think Luke. Oh, hang finished. on. We've got another question, have we? Right. Um, will development resources be available from Access for as part of a professional services package? At this stage, no. Uh, we are only there to guide you in uh, your development resource. But again, it's something that we can investigate uh, at a later time. But the initial uh, program and how it's designed is that you sh you need to have that development resource. Okay, um, I'll give it a ten seconds more, and then we will finish. If there's no more questions, yeah, there, um, you can get a copy of the slides. We do put these up on our YouTube channel um, for access to text uh, on the access for. Uh, channel page. So um, we will be sending that information out after the sessions in the next few days. When will inbound numbers be available, David, for UC Express? Yes, definitely on the roadmap. So um, we are doing a little kickoff in the coming weeks. So I don't have a specific ETA for that but it is on the roadmap and we will be um, looking to make that available. So at the moment, um, inbound numbers are available in Broadworks. So you do have to have um, basically two enterprises and two bills at the moment if you want inbound in UC Express. Um, we realize that that's uh, a little inconvenient and we are working on resolving that for you. Um, I'll give an update when I have uh, an ETA for you. Thank you. Will there be a feature to know when a user went offline? Okay. So, will there be a feature to know when a user went offline? So, add service if their handset went offline. Ah. 
No, 2.0 is purely a UI UX update. So it's not new features in terms of functionality within SAS Plus. It's just about improving uh, usability, improving intuitiveness and making it look nicer. So that's a, that would be a separate feature. All right, we'll, we'll go for a second take of um, finishing the session. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. Um, if you do have more questions, please reply to the email that will come out about the session itself uh, and we can answer those questions as well. Um, thank you all for your time today. Uh, we've run a little bit over, but that's that's great because it means that we've got a lot more intake and people are uh, talking. Uh, and thank you for today. Talk to you in December. <laughs>